Welcome everyone to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my pleasure to be with you here on another brand new episode. We're well approaching the 250 episodes now. I lose count, but I am just so thrilled to be able to continue to bring you fascinating and interesting topics and people that I meet on my healing journey. And yes, I call it a journey because language is really important. How many times have you heard people say, I am suffering from, or perhaps you're even using words like suffering. And you know what? The unconscious mind believes those things and begins to make suffering happen. So let's all cheer each other on as we change our language around healing experiences and journeys and optimizing and using words such as wellness. And my guest, we share a favorite word, and that's yet. We always add the word yet to things that if they're sort of in the negative, like this is my best day yet, or I'll say things, fun things like that. And let me introduce, he's a long, long time friend, and I'm so happy to have him here. His name is Denny Stockdale, and he is the founder of the Kindness Concert Experience. And it's an organization created to create a kinder world through music and also the power of encouragement. And I just love that topic and those topics because all of those music, kindness, and encouragement, I'm always just a fan of. And I try to incorporate encouragement and kindness in everything I do. So welcome, Denny. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks for having me back. I was on your first episode along with Charmaine from Canada. Absolutely. You guys were talking about the power of workplace bullying and how to overcome it and the kinds of traumas that it can create in us. And we, you know, science is now bearing out this idea that trauma, past traumas undealt with, can often cause disruptions in our body. Now, they don't say it causes autoimmune, but it certainly lowers our immune defenses that can make us more susceptible to autoimmune. And that was an awesome one. You know, that was one of our highest rated ones. It, it's still fantastic, still available, everyone. Just go to show number one over at understandingautoimmune.com and you can hear Denny and Charmaine Hammond talking about bullying. But tonight, Denny, I wanted to talk to you. Oh gosh, there's so many areas I could go, but I first want to talk to you about the topic of encouragement. So often when you go to a medical professional these days and then they'll say the, the label, which you and I both talk about, how we hate the word have because it promotes ownership and who wants to own our illness. We, I always say, I don't want to own the illness. I agree that there's something wrong. But I can have cockroaches, but that doesn't mean I own them. And that word have promotes ownership. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about encouragement and how we can help people get past these things like, oh, well, Sharon, I'm suffering from uh, Hashimoto's. What are some things that you suggest people do that can encourage people? Because sometimes encouragement can sound like patronizing. Absolutely. I, I think the first step in encouragement is to be silent. Silent? S-I-L-E-N-T, which, and when you take those letters, it creates the word listen. Oh, I love that. People need to be heard, regardless of what condition they might be in. You know, if somebody's suffering with MS, they might not be able to get their words out very quickly. And I was a Santa Claus for an MS Achievement Center here in, 20, in the Twin Cities for several years and won awards for volunteering with them. So I, I know a little bit about that, but when I when I think of the power of listening to somebody and just letting them tell a little bit of their story and being present, that is so encouraging. You know, I never would have thought that just sitting there listening in silence at the my first thought, but now that I'm meditating on that, what you said, that's absolutely so powerful. That's one of the first steps they talk about in grief recovery too. And I have to tell you, when I first got my diagnosis, as you know, Denny, there was some periods of grief there. There was some periods of loss there. What's the next step once we've, the people have felt, you know, say, oh, it's so nice to be heard for a change or things like that. What are some other ways that you have found that people like to be encouraged or that they see some sort of gesture as being kind? Because oftentimes when we're not feeling well, Things can be misunderstood easily if I'm in pain. I can get kind of grumpy, I have to be honest. 
Oh, I do too. I get very grumpy at times, as you know. But anyway, um, I could talk about listening for, for hours. Just make sure the people feel heard. I think asking questions to clarify where they're at or what, what's going on in their story. And a real simple statement is, tell me more. Just tell me more. Mm, I and, love that. And sometimes when I'm listening, I get triggered and I'll go off on a different tangent and I might lose a few of the important points. And if I do that, I'm, I'll, I'll own it and I'll say, you know, I just, you triggered something in me. I had a different thought. Can we revisit what you just said? Oh, how kind. How kind to say that, hey, my mind wandered for a moment there. <laughs> how nice. You know, one of the things I always say, too, and it, I, I tell me more is awesome. And sometimes I'll say just so I understand, because oftentimes when people are needing in this place of needing someone to listen to them, they might use words that I don't relate to, or perhaps I'm not clear on exactly what they mean. One time I had someone tell me about feeling loopy. And I kind of knew what that might mean to me, but I definitely knew that was a word that could have easily gone astray if I didn't ask them for more clarity around what that word meant to them. Yeah, and that's a great point too, asking for clarity on words that might be triggers or misunderstood easily. Yeah, it happens so often. But, and I did tease everyone with that first little bit about yours and one of yours and my favorite words. Why don't you describe why the word yet is such a great word? Well, because yet has so much power, because if I want something now and it hasn't happened, I can be extremely disappointed. And often I am. And then I think it hasn't happened yet, which gives me the power to step out and keep moving forward to create what I want in this world. You know, and that's kind of where I'm at right now. We talked a little bit before the interview. Right now I'm on the cusp or on, on, of launching a worldwide movement. I've got a team that's awesome. And the, the most critical factor, and this actually goes back to encouragement, about a year and a half ago, I was sitting with a colleague of mine and explaining kind of where I was at in my vision for the kindness concert experience and how music can help us heal and bring us together. And halfway through the conversation, he looked at me and he said, Denny, I believe in you. Wow, powerful words. Powerful words. Not only did he say it, I could feel it. Because of the resonance, the energy that we were exchanging in that moment. And he has proved himself time after time since that point. Oh, those are awesome words for people to share with each other. How empowering is that for both of you? Yeah. Yeah. Last weekend, I was having a difficult time myself. And I wanted to talk to somebody. But I could tell that she was really caring and wanted to hear what I had to say. So in a text message, in a simple text message, she sent me the, this phrase, come on, man, come on, man. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to hear your story. I want to be with you. I want to help you. I want to encourage you. And the, wow. Those little things, I mean, just uh, the power of a simple statement, I believe in you. And you know what was surprising that come on, man, uh, maybe it's a generational thing, Denny, <laughs> but I've never thought much of texting. I've thought it could be so easily misunderstood, misconstrued, depending on whether I, the person, I'm the reader, was grumpy or not, or whatever state my mind was in at the moment. But I love those words. It really, even if I was grumpy, I think I, I would have been able to shift my mind to a different place, to a, a stronger place. Yeah, and I was not in a place where I could drive over and meet her. Yeah, awesome. That's fantastic. Another thing is that uh, sometimes you just have to step away and allow people to go through their own process and realize it's not about me. That's true, and sometimes it's very hard. We talked before on the show about having this process of uh, quit taking it personally. A dear friend and longtime mentor of mine, Michael Grinder, has this wonderful tip he shares with his classes and workshops where he takes a Q-tip and you put it in your pocket to remind you. So the Q for quit, the T for taking, the I for it, and the P for personal. And so if you're one of those people that find you take everything personal, 
And sometimes you don't realize that till your friends tell you quit taking it personally. <laughs> sometimes we're taking it so personally, we can't even see we're taking it personally. I found the Q-tip a great visual reminder cue to, to um, kickstart me out of whatever little hole I've fallen into about where I'm so, sort of in that woe is me place for a moment or two. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I've, I've seen people and worked with people who have um, ha had an experience where they go into a trauma reaction and don't realize their surroundings and act out from that space. And, right. you know, how, how do we deal with people like that? And in my case, all I can do is not take it personally. It still hurts a little bit at times. And be patient and think of the word yet. Yes. They haven't come around yet. They haven't seen how beautiful the world is yet. Oftentimes we can even get stuck, not just in a one-on-one -on -one relationship kind of issue, but oftentimes I see with autoimmune, it becomes sort of a global issue, meaning the, the, everyone's against me. It is sort of the medical community is giving me bad news. My family doesn't understand. And it can become this cascade failure of events that where the word yet is so powerful. And I know you wrote a blog post recently that I loved, and it was about getting over it. And I love that because it's my, the part that I enjoyed was it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll share a few excerpts. You know, I, I hear get over it a lot. I don't use that phrase because I want to allow people to process their own way. But when, you, when I hear that, it also reminds me that the people that are saying that probably have an it they want to get over as well. I think we all have at least one it, don't we? Oh, we, <laughs> I have more than one, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, there's certain memories that, that trigger things. There's certain memories I'll never get over, the loss of my mom in January and the blessing that was her last two weeks on earth. She had a beautiful death, and it was still one of those it's I'll never get over. We can all reflect on those moments where people will say, get over it, and you're like, I'm not, sh I don't want to get over it. I want to learn how to deal with it or I learn to process it or learn to create a beautiful memory around it, but I don't want to get over it. Yeah. And a few minutes ago, we talked about the power of listening and just being there for people. And music also helps bring people together. It helps me process a lot of the things that I have dealt with and that others have dealt with. And when I think of it, there's three it's that came to mind. One, intense trauma. How do you ever get past intense trauma? And I've got story after story that I could share on your show. I won't just because they're too traumatic. Another it, inspiring thoughts. Hmm, that paintings a, a whole different feel to it when you say inspiring thoughts. My, my whole emotional energy shifted immediately. Yeah, and the third one that really resonates most with me is increased trust. Hmm. I'm cur currently working with a uh, writing group here in Minneapolis on a book that they're coming out with later this year, year or early next on trust. And for me, that's such a treat to be able to be trusted enough to be a consultant on this project and also to see how this book can impact people around the world, not only through your work and mine, but, you know, just in general through the World Kindness USA movement and others. Right. That's we need more trust in this world. And thank you for trusting me to be on your show again. It's awesome being with you, my friend. Oh, I always enjoy you so much. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Denny more about, oh, whatever rabbit hole we find. That's what happens when old friends get together. But some of the things we're going to talk about is the, the kindness concert experience, as well as the power of music. And back to the topic of trust and permission. So we'll be right back. Denny, as we had to take that commercial break, we were talking about the topic of trust. And I want to throw in the topic of permission. Oftentimes, people will assume they're trusted or trusting either way far more than they are and forget this whole idea of, do I have permission with this person to go there? And by that, I'm for the audience, I'm just going to share this universal topic of teenagers. If you've ever had a teenager or experienced a teenager, you'll know that the parents oftentimes 
don't have permission to say certain things, but a trusted friend, a trusted ally, an aunt or uncle, some a grandparent could say things that the parent can never get away with. <laughs> so that's, that's Denny's and my uh, definition of permission. So let's talk a little bit about building trust in someone, Denny, if they're like, hmm, I don't know. Let's talk about how we build trust with people. Listening, obviously, one of our first topics that we talked about besides, but listening. But let's talk a little bit more about the topic of building trust. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, well, there's a lot of different elements. First of all is self-trust. Can I, mm. can I trust yes. myself in this situation? And one of the tools that's helped me a lot, a little aside here, is that I have written out who I am as an encourager. What does that mean to me? What is my mission? What is my vision for, the, for my life? What are my qualities? How do I want to show up as an encourager? And when I, when I start feeling down or hard on myself or feel like everything's collapsing, I go back to that page and I'll look at those attributes and I'll say, yeah, this is important to me, my values, treating people kindly, regardless of what I have. You know, I like that. We talk a lot about journaling here, Denny, and the topic of journaling. And for the audience that isn't aware of my version of journaling is I always write the current on the right hand side of the page and leave the left side blank. And then I go back when appropriate. It's, I don't have any scheduled time. Some people write me on the show and tell me they found that, you know, every week, every month works for them, but I don't have, personally have a scheduled time, but I go back and review those pages sometimes. And on the left-hand side, write what's changed. And that helps me see too that the word yet is really powerful. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And as you probably know, I uh, have an inspirational writing course that I'll be putting out later this year. Right. And you have this wonderful, I'm just, we're going down rabbit holes here. That's what happens when old friends get together, everyone. But uh, Denny, tell us a little bit. I, I just You have an award-winning inspirational book. I do. Uh, I came out with a book 10 years ago, Conversations from the Neighborhood Ice Cream Shop, Eight Keys to Rediscovering Lost Dreams and Finding Your Life's Calling. And I will literally say that book has changed my life for the better. It's a wonderful, fun book. I can't believe it's been out a decade and how many lives it's changed in the past decade. Wow. I know, I know. And getting back to you know, self, the, the aspect of trust, self-trust is trusting ourselves and you know, being kind to ourselves regardless of what other people might say or how other people might respond to us. You know, getting back to the point, it's not about me. Get over it. Um, you know, how, how do we move on past trauma? A friend of mine, and I will, I will share this, a dear friend of mine lost a daughter last year to murder. Mm. She's a musician. And that story impacted our musical community here in the Twin Cities in a very huge way. And a number of us have come around to try to support this family through that trauma and the ongoing grief that they'll experience for the rest of their lives. Without music in the picture, they probably would not make it because music brings us together. We can share a common song together and not have to say a word. And I know how this family is feeling. Maybe not exactly. I don't know the whole story. I understand the depth of that grief and also the joy that they can create by showing up and just being kind. You know? wow. so, so that's a huge part of trust. You know, this woman trusts me with some of the deepest secrets around this event. Yes. Oh, you know? my goodness. So that's a key element, you know, going back to kindness and encouragement and all that. Once we get past self-trust, then are we trustworthy? I show up trustworthy to a lot of people. And yet there are some people that might have a perception where I'm not trustworthy. And that, again, it's not about me. Because I know I have a high level of integrity, as do you and most of the people you and I know in common. You know what I found is interesting about this perceived trust is oftentimes, this is a story on myself, there's a person I met, oh, this is probably two decades ago, a long time, uh, the less evolved me for sure. Uh, however, 
I remember a person I met and their voice reminded me of someone from my childhood. It was a, an elementary school teacher that I had a real rough relationship, but their accent, the way they pronounced the words, the length of their pause, so much of it sounded exactly like that teacher. And I have to tell you, I was transported back to fifth grade. It was the strangest thing. It had nothing to do with this person I just met other than I had been triggered by them, but I was immediately transported and saw that teacher's face in my mind's eye as clear as if I'd been standing in the room. And that was powerful for me to understand how innocent, innocent things can trigger us back to past traumas. I, I was so surprised by the power of that. Wow, that's quite a story. And, and with that awareness, what, what did you realize after that? Or Well, actually, it took me a while. I wasn't immediate. You know, you're kind of I don't know how long it was. Time suspends itself sometimes, which I, for me, when those things happen, so you kind of lose track of how long was that really. I don't know if I was standing there just with some dumb look on my face. Maybe I was. Sometimes when I go inside myself like that, when things happen, I maybe I do have a dumb look on my face. However, you know, in all honesty, I thanked him and we chatted and everything, but I knew right away I didn't want a long-term friendship with them. And it's very unfair to say, but very true, that I just wasn't at a place in my time and life there where I was able to process the difference. And I've learned so much more since in the following decades about understanding triggering and how it can transport us to a different place in time. And that sometimes it's almost as if you're back in the trauma, which is so fascinating to me, the power of the mind and power of belief to do this to us. And I hear a lot from autoimmune people who, depending on what happens to them, can actually even be triggered into past experiences around their autoimmune, where they go back in time to maybe where it was more profound, maybe some of the weaknesses or the fatigues or things were more profound just by having particular experiences. And so it fascinates me, the power of the unconscious mind to switch quickly between these moods. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what, what I'm aware of is how, how you became aware. And the next time something like that comes up, you'll be, the awareness will come quicker. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. This particular accent and pacing of tone and everything doesn't bother me anymore. But just to kind of tell a little tattle on myself that uh, I, I really couldn't, while I was nice during the event, did, just chose not to pursue any more friendship with them. And, and it was, had nothing to do about them. It was not personal. Yeah, it's one I'm of sure those. It might have felt personal, but it, it wasn't personal. Yeah, your fifth grade experience isn't something you got over yet. And you've learned to deal with it. Oh, I got over it in this in the pursuing two decades, but I do remember it, which is which is different than as you and I both know, getting over it and remembering it are two different things. I'm into that part where it's an interesting tattle tale on myself where other people might be able to learn the power of a trigger. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I, I've had, since I've become more aware of those, I've I'm a writer and I write every day. So I've got story after story after story of how people uh, don't really pay attention at times. I, I had a colleague or a friend of mine for a long time who called me a few years ago out of the blue and we started chatting and then the subject of politics comes up and I'm not a political guy. A red hot one. <laughs> and within about three minutes, he was blaming me for something a politician in Minnesota had done. And I asked him, what was the issue? And he said, this guy is a whatever you know oh, and, yes. well, let's put expletive right there <laughs> yeah, we won't. We, well because this might be a family uh, friendly radio show i'll leave that off the air but uh it was just kind of enlightening to me that i'm from minnesota a politician that he is angry with he won't tell me what he's angry about he just tells me that he's angry at the politician and now he's angry at me Mm, transference, how fascinating that is. And, you know, I've he heard people tell me that who are medical professionals say, because I can't cure, fix, whatever the, pro you know, patch up, whatever words they want to say, people will transfer their anger on to me. 
about the issue going on. And what I find fascinating, we had Sarah Payton on the show. Everyone look it up because we've had Sarah a couple of times, but we called the show the power, the trans, I think the healing power of anger, I think is the title, but look it up over at understandingautoimmune.com if you want to listen to it. And Sarah had this wonderful quote that I'll never forget because it changed my life. She said, are you angry at or are you angry that? And that really changes the locus of responsibility that I encourage people to think about because think this poor doctor who has to give this life-changing diagnosis and the people get angry at the doctor, but is it really the doctor's fault? Or aren't you angry that this condition happened or this condition is what it is? Or I, I think it's really powerful for, for people to understand Ab absolutely where the responsibility is. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I break it down real simply with anger. Is it what or who? Oh, yeah, that's, that's very similar to add or that. What or who? I love that too. You know, <laughs> that I, I, is yeah, yeah. What is the issue? Now, if this former friend of mine had explained what the issue was, then we have some talking points. I might not agree, but I can learn from the and discuss what the differences are, and we can come up with a solution as long as we focus on what. He focused on who, and he blamed me for the who that lived in Minnesota, the same state I'm from, and I haven't really had a desire to talk to that guy since. <laughs> that happened. There's too many other people that need us in this world. You know, and how does this all tie back to trust and encouragement? Can you trust somebody enough to sit with their anger? That's a good. And they trust you enough to be angry, you know? When, when I th think of an emotional model, I, I operate on four emotions, fear, anger, sadness, and joy. And everything else is a derivative of that. And I've done a lot of uh, research and writing about anger in particular, because I think it's one of the most misunderstood emotions. And we could have hours of discussion on that alone. And how does anger relate to kindness? If I can allow somebody to take out their anger on me, they might just diffuse enough so they don't take it out on somebody else who would escalate that situation. Mm, that's so true. Let's talk about how do you do that, Denny, though? I mean, that takes a strong resilience to, as we've been sharing, not taking it personally. And what sorts of things do you use to switch it around so that people realize that you're coming from kindness, even if they're coming from a different place? In my case, first thing I do is take a deep breath or two or three or four. You know, or five or six. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I do my best never to respond in a retaliatory way. Now, when you say retaliatory way, I just want to get a little clarity. Went through my mind like sometimes I think sometimes if somebody's angry and I know it's not about me, but my first response might may want to say, "Hey, man, you know, I didn't do this." <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't do this, and why are you doing this to me? But they need to be diffused. It's kind of like a pressure cooker. If you let a little steam off, they might calm down. I, I actually lost my temper about a month ago uh, because somebody was saying that I was involved in something that I wasn't involved with. And this, this gentleman was also being pretty mean to his mom. And I'll step in those situations. And at the end of the conversation, I looked at him and I said, I hope when we're calmed down, we can have a discussion about this event. And we did. And, and because of that, you know, we, we took that blowout and we've created a better bond between us. This 30 year old man who's uh, struggling with all kinds of life issues. That's, that's one thing. Take a deep breath. Just take a step back. Sometimes I won't say anything. I might, I might take a body stance that will uh, indicate you better not go there or you better stop this very quickly. And sometimes, you know, I'll walk away until that yet moment comes. No, right. And uh, another thing that's really helped me is to have a strong spiritual connection and other people who will tell me things like, I believe in you. Or come on, man. Come on, man. You're okay. I want to hear your story. I'm here for you. You know, those types of things mean the world to those 
of us who and and others who at times are marginalized. Yeah, I think we've all experienced somewhere along our lives of feeling marginalized, whether it's uh, in the medical community or otherwise. We hear that a lot on the autoimmune hour. People are marginalized because of their diagnosis or some other issues going on in their life, which is really sad and unfortunate. And being able to sit and listen to someone's story is so powerful. And we've been talking about trust and permission. And, and as you can tell, Danny and I, <laughs> we chat a lot and it goes, our stories go everywhere. But when we come back from this commercial break, we're going to talk more about the power of music and his kindness concert experience. We'll be right back. Danny, remind me the name. I kind of, I don't want to butcher the name. I remember the ice cream store, but remind me of the name of your book. Conversations from the Neighborhood Ice Cream Shop. Eight to rediscovering lost dreams and finding your life's calling. Oh, wow. That's it. great, great. Everyone go out and get a copy of it. It's an awesome book. Very inspirational. And Danny, let's switch around here because we only have a few minutes left. We have about 15 minutes left. I want to be sure to get it in. Let's talk about how you discovered the healing power of music. Now, I just want to clarify, we've had Sharon Karn on who talked about sound, like the singing Tibetan bowls and sound, tuning forks types of things. Denny are going to talk about good old fashioned music. So <laughs> Denny, what have you found about the healing power of music? Wow. That, well, first of all, it's awesome. M music can drive emotions. And emotions can help us create stories or remember stories and help us process different parts of life. And I, I was born to be a drummer. I've never played drums, but back when I was three or four, my uncle gave me a drum set because I was banging on those drums 24 hours a day. But I've never played drums. I ended up uh, with other instruments, including guitar. And it helps me get in touch with my emotions. It helps me get in touch with my story, and it helps me get in touch with other people. When I walk into a music venue, I can look at the people on stage, and without a word, they know I am there to listen and encourage and support their live music. And most of the time, I love most of the songs they do. And music has literally saved my life. You know, I through earlier in this conversation we've shared some of the difficulties that we've had in life and i've shared a couple of things i've seen within our musical community and i've also gotten to know a lot of the songwriters and musicians here in the twin cities and out and around the world one in particular is a dear friend of mine scotty miller and he wrote a song called reciprocation in the middle of that are the lyrics in the darkness don't lose your way there is peace right here today. Reciprocation, turn the wheel. Bring us together. Let us heal. Mm. Those lyrics, in my darkest hours, I turn to that and other songs to help me just make it through this moment, whatever that moment might be. And I'll, I'll bet you that as many times as he's played that particular song, Reciprocation, I've probably played it more on my CD player. <laughs> That's a beautiful song. Thank you for sharing that. I'm unfamiliar with it. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, it's a, that song is actually the foundation of the kindness concert experience that we started last year. I, what I did last year, Sharon, I took some of the musicians like Scotty who have had, had worldwide impact as well as local impact and our original songwriters who are inspirational who have songs that pe make people think and reflect on life. And I recorded six concerts last year. And then through a series of life events, I had to put that project on hold. We're rebooting it and we'll be having something starting in the next month or two and some major, major announcements coming up in the next month. So I'm very excited about this project and I'm just thrilled to be back with you again. <laughs> After 250 episodes, who knew, huh? Yeah, exactly. Who knew where this would go, this amazing journey would go for sure. Now, you know, I've been reading some research lately, which I find fascinating on they have been doing 
music, playing music, and I'll say music of someone's generation, and they find that sort of the early to teen years type of music of their generation, to people that have, have memory problems, and find that many people can remember the lyrics to these songs they grew up with, and yet maybe are unaware of their current situation or have lacking in current memory. And I find that so amazing how music can transform us and transform our brain. It just fascinates me, the power of music and what it can do. Yeah, absolutely. I think AARP sponsored a tour with a movie around that, the healing power of music and how it affects all people with Alzheimer's and dementia. And I, I, I saw the movie here in Minneapolis, and I remember when they took music into into a situation where people are not aware of what's going on around them, they suddenly light up. They start having memories. They start having physical reactions. And I imagine it happens, you know, with autoimmune and some of the other things that you and I deal with, that music can really help in those situations. And music drives emotions. Mm, For sure. I know when I'm feeling bad, I usually go put on some music from my teen years that I remember rocking out with friends and, you know, singing along to at sock hops. Yes, I'm dating myself there. I don't even know if they have those anymore, but absolutely remember those. And oftentimes many of those songs and don't have lyrics that correspond to what I'm feeling, uh, such as your beautiful reciprocation song lyrics were beautiful, but just transport me to a different place in time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, one of my first memories of uh, music, well, I've got a lot of memories of music, but one of the first songs that influenced my life was In My Room by the Beach Boys. And that's something I ask people about once in a while. What, is, what are some of your early songs that influenced your life? And my mom, my delightful mom, when I asked her that question, said, Jesus loves me. And I just... Oh, gosh, I remember that from Vacation Bible School <laughs> years ago. <laughs> so... You know, music really does have power. And if I want to process some grief, I might put on some something that's just sad as all get out. You know, an orchestral. It doesn't. It could be instrumental. It could be the lyrics. It could be both. You know, in the case of Scotty's song "Reciprocation," it's the lyrics. It's also the the way he plays it and the band. And you know, I I know a lot of his backstory, and we've become very good friends. One of the oh. things he did for me last uh, about two years ago, I was considering leaving Minneapolis at that time. And he said, Denny, you can't leave. We need you here. He shouted out in front of the audience at a, at a venue here in Minneapolis saying, Denny, we need you here. And that here I am. And look at what I'm about to launch, a worldwide movement around music and encouragement. And you are helping me to, tremendously today, Sharon. It's just what a blessing to reconnect with you, my friend. Oh, it's wonderful, too. And, you, you know, I want to circle back around to that Jesus loves me. Uh, what I was fascinated when you said that. I mentioned it took me back to vacation Bible school. And the next song that popped into my mind that I have not thought of in since I was, what, six, it was uh, This Little Light of Mine. And all of a sudden, all of these little songs I learned in vacation Bible school as a small primary school kid just came flooding back to me. It's so fascinating. I just got, for a moment, they're transported back to all of those songs from childhood. Wow. Yeah. And when you said this little light of mine, I got goosebumps. There's a spiritual dimension to everything. And when I asked my mom that question, I asked one of her caregivers what her favorite song was. And she said, this little light of mine. <laughs> and, and some of the people at my mom's uh, retirement community used to sing to her, you are my sunshine. You know, so go to, getting back to where we kind of started, you know, how do we encourage people? You are my sunshine. And you don't have to sing it. You don't have to say it. Just feel it. And other people will too. 
Yeah, that's so true. That's so true. And we're just down to about the last seven minutes, Denny. And I know everyone, we've just been circling all over, but I hope you're enjoying our our circling and our rabbit holes here. I want to come back to the Kindness Concert experience and tell us more about it and how people can find out more about it. And then we'll just wrap up some more ideas about the healing power of music. Okay, excellent. Uh, you can find us online at thekindnessconcert.com. We're uh, regrouping after some uh, life lessons last year with team building and things like that. And we're going to be really pushing more for what does music mean to us? How does music influence your life? How can we share our stories and come together and find strength through music and meaning and messages and conversations? My vision for this is to build a community starting with music that will bring people together and talk about some of the things that we talk about on your radio show and start building the trust, the self-trust. How do we encourage ourselves when the world collapses around us? These are some of the topics that I want to explore and how, to, how does music help us make, make it through the day and through those days when it doesn't seem like we can make it through one more moment. And then we think of the power of one word, yet. So it's a matter of music, meaning, messages, and just building a community and making it safe for people to share their stories and feel like they're not so alone in their isolation sometimes. You know, I've experienced, and I'm sure you have too, a lot of people that compartmentalize themselves or live with the labels that other people have put on them, and they don't realize the beauty that they have inside. Music helps bring that out. If I can play a song that just for a moment brings a smile to your face or helps you process something that's been very difficult in the mouth, that's just life you know, uh, I, I don't have a word for it except music, you know. <laughs> That's absolutely wonderful. And one of the things that came to my mind about this was when you said people can compartmentalize. And I'm thinking of how often I meet people who are not just autoimmune, any sort of life event. And you say, how are you today? And they go, I'm fine. And yet we know very well that they're not fine. And I was thinking that when the times that I have even been guilty of saying I'm fine, going and turning on some song, whether just some song that comes to my mind, just turning it on, how it really has the power of taking me away. And for those moments, I am fine. And that's what's so powerful to me about this whole idea of song and music. And you don't even have to play an instrument like Denny plays instruments as well, which because I'm sure that would be uh, life transporting as well, transporting our current situation to other places as well. Let's talk a little bit, Denny. I know you're quite the accomplished musician, as you mentioned earlier on, but let's just talk about that for a quick moment before we have to go. I've been playing guitar for about 50 years, and I don't play in public yet. Yet. (laughs) I've put a few things out on Facebook from time to time, and the feedback I get from our musical community and a lot of the musicians I know is you should be doing more. One of the greatest compliments I got was a couple of years ago when one of our local guitar slingers, who's just top notch, he played in India last year, he asked if he could jam with me because he and he said, I think I can learn from you because I've kind of developed my own style by watching a lot of people online and watching a lot of musicians and paying attention. And I find that when I play for myself, whether anybody else ever hears me, I get some healing out of that. Yeah. So, and whether you play a musical instrument or not, we all have a voice and you can hum along to a song or just breathe along to a song. You know, if you're breathing along to a song in rhythm, that song might resonate differently. You know, it's interesting you bring that up. Just this last weekend, I was at an event and they had a beautiful group come in that were from India and they played their very unique instruments. I don't remember honestly the different names of all the variety of instruments, but that was a wonderful concert where they explained these very unique instruments to us. 
and then treated us to about 90 minutes of the most fascinating music that took me on this emotional journey. Some of them were old folk songs they told us, and you would almost feel like you're out in the country somewhere da dancing, and others as I closed out the event. I found myself just getting more and more relaxed to the point where uh, by the end of the concert, that breathing was in harmony and sync with the tempo of the music. And I could see how they had taken us on this journey of the folk songs at first that were all exciting and very almost dance-like. And then by the time they ended the concert, we were all ready just to be sort of tucked into bed almost. It was just a delightful way to end one of our evenings together as a group. And what was fascinating to me was this was music I had heard, but really not familiar with the style of music much. I mean, I can't say I'd never heard it, but I've heard it, but hadn't ever really explored it. And so appreciated this marvelous 90 minute journey into just a completely different world that took me so many places. I know, I know. Yeah, and, and when you take music and you combine it with conversation and or writing like you and I both do, it becomes even more powerful, you know, because I, I, I can hear the song and then later I can process some of the things through the writing that I do daily and also share some of the stories that with myself that I might want to reflect back on. You know, we talk about kindness and encouragement. And if I'm going to be kind to myself, it's important for me to know my story and forgive myself enough so that I can move forward and have that self-trust that we've talked about on this show and also share that kindness and the joy of life with each other. And sometimes the joy comes from seeing somebody who has gone through extreme difficulties and seeing how well they still stand up and show up. Thank you so much, Denny. I think that's where the autoimmune hour is all about is inspiring hope and help for people to show up and stand up and be their true self, be true to, to themselves, and be their true self. Those are different things, by the way. As we continue to optimize every day, as Denny mentioned, he's been playing musical instruments for decades, and he optimizes every day in his practice and to the point where he gets where people are wanting to play with him as well. It's awesome. And just think that if we continue to optimize our wellness regime, our wellness rituals, as we continue to go on our experience, our autoimmune experience, our healing journey with autoimmune, how great and grand will be because each day is not a new beginning, as sometimes people say, because in the healing process, in the wellness process, it's all about building on the previous day. We're building, we're optimizing just one little bit more of our self. And pretty soon, before you know it, and some people say, well, then after the end of the year, you got 365. And I said, absolutely, that's not quite correct because it exponentially grows. So just think about that, that one day and then two days is not exactly just one more day because you're adding on top of what you did that first day. So everyone, let's commit to a wonderful healing and wellness journey, optimizing every day and being sure incorpor incorporating music into that to keep us connected, to trust ourselves and to be that person that someone can have trust in. So thank you, Danny, for being part of the show. As always, it's great to talk to you, my dear friend. And check out the Kindness Concert Experience. Everyone, have a great week. Whatever your adventures, join us next Friday night for another brand new episode. And as always, you can find all the previous episodes, including Danny's, which was our first one, back over at Understanding Autoimmune. Have a great week, whatever your adventures, enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio.